What is happening everyone, welcome back to another video, and today we are checking out the Bobo VR X6. Now I know, it's been a while, it's been a long while since I have last uploaded a video, almost a year now. So you're probably asking, where were you, what happened, why haven't you uploaded a video? Well, long story short, to really simplify it, I was just sick of my content. I did not like the content I was making, in terms of style, in terms of workflow, everything about it was getting really boring really quickly, not only for me, but for the viewers as well, because I was simply doing the same thing for about two and a half years, with not a whole lot of improvement. So I decided to work on my other channel where I do other tech reviews, some of you already know about it, and before I knew it, it actually outgrew this channel by a whole lot, almost double. And the cherry on top was that VR was getting really boring. I mean, let's be honest, getting pretty boring, not a whole lot has actually happened in 2018, we got the Oculus Go, which people have forgotten about in a couple months it's got good software good optics and everything but we'll probably revisit it at one point and the only exciting thing was probably the samsung odyssey plus and that's it with that being said that's just of what happened during the last year and why i have disappeared but now I'm coming back just in time for the next generation of headsets. So with that being said, this is the state of all-in-one VR headsets in 2019. And make sure you stick around for the end of the video, where you'll be getting a sneak peek at what I have in store for you guys this month. So anyways, without further ado, let's get right into it. Alright, so first of all, this thing is running Android 7.1. And being an all-in-one headset coming up from China means it's going to be running one OS and one OS only. And that would be the Nibiru OS. Now, some of you already know about it, some of you don't. If you do, cool. If you don't, well, basically, it's your only option if you want to make an all-in-one headset coming up from China. It's been in development for a couple years now, and in every revision it has some improvements. So starting off from the front we got a simple mesh, over here we have an LED light that lights up when the headset is on. On the right side we got the controls and the focus dial, it's smooth and it doesn't have too much resistance and it is not too loose. We get the volume up, volume down, the Nibiru OS button, the OK button, the back button, and of course the power button. Now as you can imagine it's pretty hard to actually navigate through these buttons because they're pretty much the exact same. They feel the same, it's really hard to tell what you're pressing. That being said of course the most popular option was to always get one of these bad boys right here, which is a simple Bluetooth controller for your phone. Or you can get something similar to this thing, which is about $2. This is actually a Daydream controller, so, but you get the idea. And the prices for these controllers online, they actually range from about $2 all the way to $50. So you can go ahead and choose whatever you want. It doesn't have to be anything special. In fact, you can go ahead and hook up your mouse and keyboard if you really want, which can be done through the OTG option right over here. This is of course the micro USB charging port and it takes about two and a half hours to charge fully and the battery does drain in a consistent rate, so it does hit the numbers that it advertises in terms of the battery life. As for actual usage, it should last you about four hours or so, which does actually beat the Oculus Go by a whole lot, which is pretty funny because although this thing is pretty powerful, it runs off a single puny 18650 battery, which really doesn't last that long. And that's why this thing struggles to get two and a half hours. So now you know why. Now, do these guys compare? Well, not really. I have already discussed that matter with them and they have told me that this thing was actually made mainly for medical, business, and education purposes. Well, to put it simply, it is not something you should be comparing to the Oculus Go in any way. It's a completely different purpose and we are reviewing it because I thought it would be pretty interesting. So anyways, back to where we were, we have the micro SD card slot right here, which does support up to 128 gigabytes. A quick look at the left side, we got a simple logo, and finally take a look at the back, we got a couple things going on here, and one of them being is the built-in speakers. Now we have seen multiple different implementations of this thing on Google Cardboard headsets, and they all vary a whole lot in terms of comfort, and audio quality, and balance, because in a way these do add some counterweights. Speaking of weight, this thing actually weighs about 570 grams, which can be considered heavy, but it is an all-in-one headset after all. And the hinges here actually have a whole lot going on for them, we have the cable going on through them, we have some metal pieces, some plastic pieces, and a fairly satisfying click or a couple clicks depending on where you open it. Now of course you can also detach the strap, so if you want to use it as a pick up and go demo headset, you can easily do that and it actually makes a whole lot of sense. They can just pick it up, put it against their face and try it out. Now the built in speakers here are pretty okay, they're not crazy good, they're not amazing, they don't distort, they get pretty loud, but there is nothing special in terms of the audio quality. It's just simple audio that is going to get the job done. Now as for comfort, we got a couple areas of padding, so of course we have the ear pads right here, which are pretty okay, they are made from the same material as this part. They're not over the ear and they're not really on the ear, they're kind of in the middle they do a pretty decent seal, just good enough to not be too uncomfortable. Right beside the headphones we get some paddings for your temples, which is actually pretty interesting, this is the first time we see this. And finally for the comfort level we got the face pad as well as the nose room, and if you're wondering, yes this thing does support glasses, which is pretty awesome. Even with my very wide glasses that I've recently got, they do fit in pretty decently. Now there's actually one more thing for glasses, there's some spacers right here on the side. One of them of course is to allow your glasses to fit in there, but at the same time I feel like if you have a wide enough glasses, they will actually stop you from your glasses directly touching the lens and scratching each other. So I think that's pretty interesting. So anyways, back to the face pad, it's actually pretty decent. I mean face pads, they have gotten a whole lot better over the years. They can't really go wrong because it's 2019, it's about time, right? 
it is perforated, so you can get some pretty good ventilation. And yes, you can easily detach it and reattach it, you know, so that these little pieces actually cover these screw holes. Which, who knows, we might actually go ahead and take it apart at some point. You'll also notice that it's fully detachable from the plastic bracket, so if you want to make your own face pads, you can easily do so. And take a look inside, there's actually not a whole lot going on. Right up here, we got the proximity sensor, which will automatically turn on and off the displays when you're putting it on, taking it off. And take a look at the bottom here, we got a simple nose piece. Although it's meant to actually block out light from the nose area, for some people like me, it can get pretty annoying. And with this one, it's got something that I would love to see on high-end headphones, and that would be an easily removable nose piece, because this thing is absolutely awesome just for that. Now, is it terrible? No, it's actually a very soft material. It does feel pretty decent. It's not as terrible as other headphones, such as the Samsung Odyssey, which is pretty surprising. But at the same time, they allow you to attach it and detach it very easily. You can just simply pop it in without much effort. As for the Samsung Odyssey, if you guys remember, it would actually rip the whole entire nose piece if you try to do so. So yeah, the nose room here, it's actually pretty decent. It's got plenty of room. In fact, it's about 40 millimeters wide and around 20 millimeters deep. So plenty of room for pretty much everyone. As for the overall comfort, including the strap, the ear pads, the face pad, and the side pads, it's going to definitely take some fiddling around to get the right adjustments. And even then, at most, it's going to feel decent. It's not terrible. Trust me, we have seen much worse, but it's definitely not the best. And what you see here is how it looks like when it is turned on. And finally, let's go ahead and take a look at the lenses, which is something I have not reviewed in a very long time. So what we have here are 50mm lenses that are focus adjustable, but not IPD adjustable. Now, as for the IPD, I have measured it and I got around 63. So if you have an IPD that is too far from that number, then you're not going to have the best experience. That being said, the focus adjustment here is pretty good, and I can still focus on these lenses without my glasses. And the distortion is not terrible, because again, it has a pretty big sweet spot. The lenses here, as you can see, they are not for nine lenses, they are just some regular convex lenses. As for the display here, we have a 5 5 inch 1440p display now as what type it is i'm guessing it's some kind of type of lcd it's probably not ips but that being said it is running at 72 hertz which is actually only possible because of the new all-winner vr9 chip and that is actually a chip that is meant for these type of headsets only one headsets that are running android it's basically a chip that was designed and optimized for vr and if you actually read the spec sheet for it, which is pretty interesting, I'll leave a link for it in the description below. They claim that it can actually decode 6K footage at 30 FPS and 4K at 60. And there's a bunch of different things that you can actually go in and take a look at in the spreadsheet. So if you want to read into that, it's a pretty interesting read. That being said, are the displays here bad? They are pretty decent in color. It's not terrible. They are actually brighter than the Pimax 4K. And the screen door effect is actually better than the Vive. Definitely better, but a bit worse than the Oculus Go. And the claimed FOV here, based on my previous experience, it's around 105. But after reading the spec sheet, it's actually 110, which is pretty accurate. As for the pixel arrangement, there's something that is kind of off. I can't put my finger on it. Here's a picture of what it looks like up close. So... There you go. As for the flickering you see here, it's very normal. It happens with a lot of headsets that have high refresh rates. And since this thing is running at 72 hertz, it's really bound to happen. So far, I actually have not had any issues with the flickering. But what I did have an issue with was the IPD. And you might be asking, is the 72 hertz refresh rate noticeable over 60? I would say yes, it's slightly better than 60. You can definitely tell that it is faster than 60. Anyways, that's actually pretty much it for the lenses and the display. Let's go in and finally take a look at the software, which should have changed during the past two years or so. And we should see some improvements, right? Well, let's go in and take a look. Ah, oh, shit. Here we go again. All right, and this is what it looks like inside the headset, except the way I'm recording this footage is by actually casting the display of the headset onto my TV that is being recorded by my camera. So anyways, I'm not going to try to stick here for too long. It's not going to be the greatest footage to look at while I'm explaining things. This is the home screen. This is what you can see when you first start up the headset. The actual layout has not changed a whole lot since we last reviewed it, but this is what we have. So starting off with the status bar at the top here, we have the clock, which is in 24-hour format. Then we have the Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and the SD card indicators, as well as the battery life in percentage, which is pretty useful. On the bottom here, we have the built-in video player, the game section, the photos, and the VR browser. On the bottom here, we have five apps, which are your recent apps. So wherever you're launched last, they will show up here. And then on the the bottom we have the settings the application section the store and the favorites and if you take a look around here it's basically a 360 photo and that's what they call a theme and we're going to take a look at the themes in just a bit so let's go ahead and take a look at the settings real quick we have the bluetooth section the wi-fi section then we have the general section and as we can go ahead and choose your brightness your sound your language your themes and the passwords and of course the time zone as for the themes things have not changed i mean this is the same theme we have seen before it's an oversaturated over edited image uh, most of them are pretty much just made up of really old Blender projects or something. I'm not even too sure. And uh, 
Don't even get me started on this background. I, I think I see even a watermark here. I'm not even too sure. Then we have the system area, which you can go ahead and update. You can reset your factory settings. And you can go ahead and mirror your display, which is what I'm currently doing, which is again, a very nice feature to see on an all-in-one headset. Then we have the store, and this is where you can go ahead and find the very limited amount of applications, which are, in my experience, rarely updated. These are applications you're not even gonna care about. We have the Google Cardboard Designer uh, Lab, and it doesn't actually run, crashes on start. Then we have the local player, which is actually a pretty decent player this is for example a 3d video and this is actually my first time checking out 3d videos on a headset and I have to say it is definitely much better than going to the theaters um, the effect really sells because you're looking at it straight on and not at an angle and you don't have any crappy scratched up 3d goggles from the theaters that they give you but yeah the nice thing about this VR player is that it actually has a whole lot of options so you can go ahead and choose whenever you start a new video it will actually ask you what kind of format it is if it's a 2d if it's a 3d side by side or an over and under at the same time, it'll ask you if it's a 360 video, an 80, a spherical, and that kind of stuff, which is pretty great. We also have some brightness controls, the volume controls right here, which are pretty useful. And inside this menu, you can go ahead and choose if you want to loop the video for whatever reason. Maybe you're in the tourism business and you have a headset that kind of shows people what the uh, destination is like. Next up, we have the game section. And once again, we don't have much because I actually haven't installed anything and I doubt anyone will be interested in playing games on something like this. So if you go in and try to run the one included in the store, we will see that it just simply crashes out. Moving on to the photo section, we have the photos and uh, they're photos that take a while to load, even the previews. It's uh, pretty decent, I mean, it's good quality. It's moving on, we have the VR browser and I have to say this is something you should not even bother with because you might as well just take out your phone. So let's go ahead and try Google and see how long it takes and uh, let's go ahead and try to search something. I think the keyboard is not even coming out because I have a Bluetooth controller and the thing the Bluetooth controller has a keyboard on it which it doesn't. Let me go ahead and show you guys what the Nibiru button does, which is the one on the side. And that should open up the special menu. So this is the Nibiru menu and it's very trippy because the FOV is very distorted and it just, it's terrible. I, they need to fix this. Yeah, you got the brightness, you got the volume controls, pretty much you can open up this menu on any application or you can do force close. And in some applications such as YouTube, let's go ahead and back out of here. It takes a while. All right, come on. We go to the application section, we can see that we have YouTube and uh, it pretty much runs as a smartphone. So, and we still have this really bad distorted effect. It does have a couple controls here. And honestly, if you wanna do anything, it's very tedious and it's not very intuitive. You can actually scale it up and whatnot. We can also change it to a uh, landscape and um, you know, the brightness, the controller right here, which is the one that pops up and you can lock the window if you just wanna do whatever. If you actually try to watch any videos, it takes forever and you're gonna end up with ads and you're trying to skip the ad, but that doesn't work, you end up clicking on the ad. And if you wanna watch a 360 video off YouTube, well, well, good luck. It's not gonna work. Well, anyways, let's go ahead and conclude this video. All right, so here we are at the end of the video and uh, pretty much have finished recording that segment literally right before the SD card had ran out. And I think that was the best recording I had because I was re-recording most of this video. I'm trying to make it concise, really trying to cut down on anything useless. And I'm just trying to get back in the groove of reviewing VR. So don't worry, most videos are not gonna be like this. They're gonna be a bit more organized. They are gonna be more scripted, but I digress. Let's go ahead and talk about what we have here. So what is the state of all-in-one Chinese headsets in 2019? Well. It's still not ready for the Western market. It's uh, the Nibiru OS, although they have been developing it for a while. I think it has a long way before it actually gets somewhere that is usable. My biggest problem with these kind of headsets is the software. It's not good enough. It doesn't have a lot of compatibility and the navigation system is always pretty bad. The controls have always been on the sides and they're really just not the best. In terms of comfort, these headsets still need a whole lot of work on comfort. Maybe add the battery to the back of the headset so you can have some counterweight and maybe have a simpler strap design so things don't feel too awkward. For example, the older one headsets from Magic C, their main goal was media and gaming, and they even had an HDMI input option, which was pretty cool at the time. While this one on the other hand is mostly focused for business, medical, and education purposes. I'm not too sure about medical. As for education, it kind of makes more sense, but unless the actual school district has enough budget to pay for it, and the brand itself providing good service, like replacements and repairs, um, I don't think it's gonna take off that much, but again, those are my opinions. I don't know much about this thing. All I'm here is to actually review the physical hardware. Once again, things I would like to see improved is the OS. I would like to see much better controls. The displays need to improve a bit more, and especially the actual lenses, and the comfort, and the counterbalance, and, um, and pretty much everything. It's not a terrible headset. It's there for a reason. And again, if it didn't have its own use case, then it wouldn't exist. 
You may call it crappy, but it is definitely serving a purpose somewhere in the world. So anyways guys, that is actually pretty much for this video. As I have promised, I have some stuff to show you guys that I'll be reviewing very soon, hopefully this month. And yeah, let me show you what I have. All right, so here's something that I've actually been working on for the past uh, five months or so. It's been in the works. And if you were on my Discord, you would know about this thing. Basically, this is the Project North Star AR headset. It's a do-it-yourself, put-it-together, 3D printed headset. And uh, it took a while to print. It took a while to calibrate everything, make sure everything looks good for the printer. But I have still not calibrated the actual headset. This thing actually costed me about like $500, $600 at this point. I'm not even too sure. We're getting off track here. Basically, it's an AR headset. It's pretty cool. So here's a quick video clip that you may have seen at one point that should give you a pretty good idea of what this thing can do. And moving on to the other side of the room, we have the Deepon E3C, which is running off the Nola VR system. The Nola VR is actually included in the packaging. So we're also going to have another video checking out the state of Nola VR in 2019. And for all time's sakes, we actually have two more Google Cardboard headsets we're going to be reviewing in 2019. Yes, I know it's going to be pretty exciting, especially if you're one of the original viewers. Now, if you guys remember, the original unspoken goal of this channel was to find out what was the ultimate Google Cardboard headset. I've actually ordered this one and got it back in January, but I never got to actually review it. And they have actually sent me this one and arrived about a week ago. So once again, thank you all for watching. Sorry for not being able to uh, upload for the past year. Uh, things got in the way. And who knows, I may have a dedicated video or a stream where I can talk about it more in depth. So other than that, that is pretty much it for this video. So thank you all for watching and I'll catch you guys in the next one. Take care, everyone.